And now, you're tuned in to All Factors Considered. Here are your hosts, Derek G and AJ. What's going on, folks? Welcome back to another episode of All Factors Considered. It's UFC 262. It's a big one. It's a pay-per-view, and we got a lot of bouts to cover today. But before we do that, drop a like, subscribe, you know, hit the yellow notification bell. That way you get access to all three shows we put out every single week. But you already know what the deal is. Let me bring in my co-host, AJ. AJ, what's going on, brother? Back again. You got the Iron Mike Tyson shirt on going. How are you feeling going into UFC 262? What's the vibes feeling like? You hyped up? What do you think? Well, the vibe, man, the vibe is it's going to be a hell of a hell of a card, right? And I need I need some payback from last week, man. I got to get a couple wins under my belt. It was, a, it was a struggle, so I'm hoping this one's going to be a little better for me. How's your vibes going into this next week, Derek? I, I'm feeling very good about this, man, and I'm feeling a little nervous because I did pretty good the last two weeks, so you know there's always some correction bound to happen. But nonetheless, we do the work. We put in the time to do the film study, man, so everything should be going according. Um, I will say this. I'm a little disappointed in this card just because we were supposed to have Leon on Edwards versus Nate Diaz on this card and it got pushed over to UFC 263 so it's just one more pay-per-view away but nonetheless that would have been crazy to have that on top of all the crazy prelims it's 12 bouts on this card folks man so it's gonna be a lot a lot of good stuff man but why not uh why are we missing any words AJ how about we get straight into it let's do some sleepers so you know what time it is it's time for some fight night if you ain't paying attention are you gonna sleep on me or I'm gonna wake you up all right AJ I'm gonna start the clock and if you don't mind start off with your first sleeper for UFC 262 yeah, I would love to, Derek. And for my first sleeper, man, I got Gina Mazzani versus Priscilla Cachoeira. Now, Gina Mazzani, she's a scrapper. This is the 125 division, so these are some light girls, all right? And Gina Mazzani, she'll blitz you, but then she'll start taking some pictures. Sit there, so she's ready to get tagged back. And now Priscilla Cachoeira, she's had a little bit of a rough streak, all right? she In her last fight, she got put, or she put everyone on notice and absolutely destroyed Oh man, I, I just I just blinked the boxer. I didn't write it down. She's a hell of a boxer. Destroyed her in like thirty some seconds with an amazing uppercut. Priscilla Cachoeira can bang. All right. Now this is a sleeper to me because even though this is buried a little bit in the prelims, you sleep on these ladies and they're gonna bury you. All right. This can be very very fun. Derek, who's your first sleeper? Right on, man. I like that. I like that. So I got some women flyweights going on over here. And these are some recognizable names, at least if you've been watching this program. So we got Andrea Lee facing off against Antonina Shevchenko. You heard the Shevchenko right. It's big sister. It's not the champ. It's not Valentina, but it's the big sister. First and only commercial pilot in the UFC. Come on. But the reason why this is a sleeper to me is because Andrea Lee, she's a Muay Thai, BJJ, and karate practitioner. And if you know who Antonina Shevchenko is, you know she's a very, very decorated kickboxer. 39-1 and one in her kickboxing career. She is a uh, four-time Muay Thai gold medalist over there in uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan or wherever the case, Peru or something like that. But nonetheless, so Andrea Lee, she started off her career 3-0 and in the UFC, and since then, she's dropped three straight. So she know you know her back is against the wall, and she's looking for a big win. Can Antonina stop her from getting that win and propel herself up the rankings? That's why this is a sleeper. It's going to be a striking clinic. And just know, Andrea Lee, she's a little stiff in her striking, but it's because she's a Muay Thai practitioner. She likes to sit down on those shots and let her hands fly, man. It will be a good Good one. AJ, what's your next sleeper? It's crazy to me that uh, KGB Lee and Big Chev are in the, in the prelims, Derek. If you're a fight fan, that's, you feel the same way. And this this sleeper to me is kind of the same thing because it's Mike Grundy versus Lando Venata. And, and all I really got to say is Lando Venata on the prelims. Okay. Like, how do we get so lucky? This is going to be exciting, man. And throw in Mike Grundy, who he's been tapping people left and right like he's a rock star backstage since his early bring up. Man, this is going to be a very interesting fight. A lot of fun, man. And it's it's truly a sleeper because how are we getting so lucky on the prelims? But this one's going to be fun. Who's your next sleeper, Derek? All right, AJ. Before, I, I just want to give a little comment on what you just said. So I had talked about last week uh, in our, I think it's our post show, about Peter Queeley, right? And I'd asked you if you know who Peter Queeley was, right? So Mike Grundy fights out of that same camp that Peter Queeley does. So in 2021, I believe Mike Grundy has already fought, so he might be 1-0. and oh, But nonetheless, uh, Conor McGregor is really the only losing fighter in 2021 out of that SBG camp. So you know Peter Queeley trying to get the wins, Mike Grundy trying to get the wins. It's going to be a good one. But to my sleeper, this is my last sleeper before we start breaking down these fights. I got a uh, couple couple 185 pounders. I got Jamie Pickett facing off against Jordan Wright. And uh, both of these dudes are powerhouses, man. Jamie Pickett, he's a real deal powerhouse with an 80 inch reach. And that right cross is the money shot, man. I will say eight of 11 of his wins have come via knockout. So, you know, this dude's ready to put people to sleep. And, uh, you know, come on. He has a tall task ahead of him in terms of Jordan Wright because he is the Beverly Hills Ninja. Uh, trains out of Jackson Wink. So, you know, he's training with high level competition. All 11 of his wins are via knockout or submission. It's six knockouts, five submissions on his resume. 
And in his UFC debut, AJ, his UFC debut, he dropped Ike Villanueva with a spinning hook kick. That was the first shot to open up the fight. So you know the man has iron balls. He has iron cojones right there. Because who does that in your UFC debut? Nonetheless, he took the first loss. Excuse me. He took the first loss of his career in his last fight against Joaquin Buckley. He got knocked out in the second round. So you know he's looking for revenge, and we're we're in for some fireworks. This will definitely be a good one on our hands. So um, AJ, let me bring you back in, and let's uh, let's do Here's it. Here's another main card breakdown, courtesy of your hosts Derek G and AJ. All right, man, we got a featherweight matchup to open up the pay per view. AJ, man, who would have thought we get this type of matchup to open things up? Number nine ranked Shane Burgos facing off against number 13th ranked Edson Barbosa, man. Uh, where do we start from here, AJ, man? These, we know one thing for certain here. I don't think we're going to see now one takedown. Now, Edson Barboza has talked about, yeah, man, you know, I'm ready everywhere for a war. Feet, ground, wherever, but I really do not see that happening. I see this being an incredible kickboxing match, an incredible boxing match, all types of striking fiascos going on. But nonetheless, AJ, who stands out to you more? Both of these dudes are volume guys. Both of these dudes are pace guys. Both of these dudes have power. But who stands out to you just when you saw, ooh, Burgos versus Barboza? Okay, give me your thoughts. Well, I, I agree with you 100%, Derek. And the first note I wrote down is we're going to see kicks on kicks on kicks, man. It's oh, yeah. going to be a lot of fun, especially if you like kicks boxing. But who stood out to me a little more? But honestly, it was kind of Shane Burgos. This is going to sound crazy, but Shane Burgos in my head stood out a little more just of his recent stuff. He had a great fight against uh, Makwan or Makani. He had the split decision win against Cub Swanson. That one was, you know, here or there. But he's been fighting dudes. He's been fighting top of the heap talent for a long, long time, as well as, you know, Edson Barbosa. And he just, Edson Barbosa to me, for a long time has been that gatekeeper position, not really advancing, you know, kind of a 50 50 fighter. He's, you know, uh, two and three in his last five, but again, fighting top of the heat competition. And the, the, the big thing to me, Edson Barbosa, we were seeing a, a resurgence of him because he also had an amazing fight against Marquani when he grew back the hair and he got back to his roots, man. Edson Barbosa is that classic Brazilian fighter. We love to see, we love to talk about that. We like seeing man. So, it was, it's weird for me saying that uh, Burgos stood out a little more and like, ooh, who's you know who's going to be back and forth? Because Barbosa is one of the all-time great strikers. Who stood out to you and why, Derek? Well, I have to agree with you. It is Shane Burgos, just because he's like that that newer generation of fighter, right? Edson Barbosa is a name. He's been around forever, right? Now we got 13-2 and two Shane Burgos, who is – talk about weaponizing pace. This man weaponizes it, man. And he talks about it, too. He's like, dude, I'm going to keep walking forward. There's only one way you could really slow this man down, and that's by blitzing him. That's the only way. Because every take him to the ground, he's going to get back up, and he's going to walk you back down. And we saw that against Makwan Amirakani, which was very impressive. Because if, if you know about Makwan Amirakani, you know the man is a pace machine. Makwan Amirakani is looking to grapple, looking to take you down, looking to tire you out. I will have to say, in that fight against Shane Burgos, though, Makwan Amirakani did talk about, and I don't know if this is an excuse or not, AJ, but he did talk about how he had a very botched weight cut and it was really evident because in the third round of that fight dude was done he didn't even want to like get up he's the grappler and he was tired and you never see wrestlers get tired or you do sometimes but that's not really indicative of what a wrestler is nonetheless aj um let's start breaking down you know how this fight is going to take place so i have a question for you off the bat and that question is who do you think out of these two fighters fights better off of their back foot and who will be fighting off of their back foot in this matchup Hmm. Um, I would say who's better at fighting off their back foot would be Edson Barbosa. He's had a little bit more experience at it. He's gone the, you know, the full where he's the guy full pressuring as well as he's the guy having to counter strike. Whereas Shane Burgos, especially in his last fight against uh, Josh Emmett, he was kind of showboaty and a little t for for my own taste, a little too showboaty for the amount that he was delivering. If he's delivering KO knockouts left and right, you know, just crazy stuff back and forth, and he can be as flashy as like a Michelle Pereira, for instance. But that and that's he has that same kind of fight style where he's kind of flat, like uh, like kind of showboaty, keeps his hands low. He'll he's there to get hit. Um, but if I had to give the advantage and who I think is going to be walking down the whole time, I think it's going to be Shane Burgos. He has a little bit more youthful vigor. He's going to take a little bit more of the machismo stance, kind of walk him down. And I think Edison Barbosa is going to be there to counter strike him. Like I said, Shane Burgos keeps his hands low and he's there to be hit. And I think Edison Barbosa being the veteran he is can capitalize on that pretty great. What do you think? 
Well, I think that this fight is going to be a very ebb and a flow, right? I don't think it's going to be one way this way or one way this way. It'll be like this the entire fight. And folks that are just listening, I'm just going back and forth because I think it truly will be back and forth, back and forth. No one is going to be absolutely dominating the entire time unless it does happen because it is the fight game and anything could happen in the fight game. Nonetheless, um, I actually think that Shane Burgos fights a little bit better off of his back foot. And the reason why I say that is because I just think there's a difference. Not that, maybe not better, but he fights differently off of his back foot than Barbosa does. So Barbosa, when he's looking to counter off of his back foot, you know he's throwing that shin like a baseball bat into your ribs you know that he's looking for the big shot the big liver shot with the hooks he's looking for big powerful set my feet and just smash right now Shane Burgos is a little bit different I really view him as a volume striker like a Max Holloway right he actually speaking of that he has the most significant strikes landed per minute at in the featherweight division with 7.3 uh, significant strikes landed per minute that's the highest that's you think Max Holloway has that but he doesn't nonetheless he's looking to just kind of tap you up as he's going backwards it's not the most effective I'm not going to say he and lie to you but it's just a little bit different and that's the that's the beauty of this matchup is we're getting we're going to get to see all right does the power guy who sits down on all the shots win or is just the dude who's going to touch you up and just accumulative damage win we always talk about these types of matchups because it's just that's how it works and we're going to talk about that in the next matchup as well because it's a very similar situation nonetheless aj when it comes down to it Edson Barbosa, being that in his pre-fight interviews, is talking about, ooh, if this fight wants to, if we go into the ground, I'm ready to go to the ground. Well, Shane Burgos, he has the uh, second best takedown defense at 145 pounds with the 89% takedown defense. So this dude's legit, man. And, and if this is going to be a striking contest like we talk about, man, it's going to come down to who has the better chin. I really believe that, man. Burgos has pop on his shots too, man. He has five knockouts, five submissions, three decisions. Barbosa, 12 knockouts, one submission, eight decisions. So if someone does land the big shot, we know Barbosa is going to beat up the body, right? We know he's a body hunter, actually, in his fight against, uh, I, I believe it was his last fight. Edson Barbosa, his his percentage counts, it was like a 56% to the body, 25 to the head, and like 18% to the legs, man. So that's the that's the key to slowing down a pace machine, though, right? Is you gotta beat up that body. So both of these fighters like to beat up the body as well, though. They're just so evenly matched in these ways, man. Who do you give an edge to? Like who are you liking in this fight so far? It's hard because they like you said, man, they really are kind of back and forth, the same kind of style, yeah. same kind of, you know, like you said, you said it perfectly with the ebb and flow. I do think that fight's going to go back and forth a lot and it's going to it might take place on the ground. I don't really think it's going to. I think we're going to see a ton of kicks, but it might. But personally, man, I'm going to give a little bit of an edge and it's going to go contrary to my pick, but I'm going a little bit of edge to uh, to Shane Burgos. I think he does have a little bit of that youthful kind of, you know, exuberance kind of that flow that he has and just kind of that little bit of momentum going back and forth for him whereas Barbosa's kind of had what some would consider being on the tail end of his career um as far as that go I, there's a little bit of um, advantage to that you know being a little more experienced but you know Shane Burgos has been doing it for quite a while so I don't think experience is going to necessarily come into play I do think the chin is what's going to come into play on this one because both these boys are going to be cracking Derek Okay, so let me ask you this question, though, because this is what I really think it comes down to. We know Edson Barbosa, and this is really weird. That's why I was stumbling over my words in the beginning, because when you think of Edson Barbosa, you think 155 pounds. You think about classic wars like him against Paul Felder. You think about him against Justin Gaethje, right? Like, you're thinking about these wars, but that's not what we're seeing, because this dude is fighting at 145 pounds. So he went down a weight class, right? And this is what's really interesting, is because he's tied for the most knockout wins in lightweight history. He's tied with Melvin Gilliard, and I think it's something crazy. It's probably like eight or 10 or something like that but nonetheless um that like how much is that going to play into a factor we always talk about all factors considered right we have to factor in this he's moving down so he naturally will have more power right naturally unless getting sucked down to 145 diminishes some power but i don't really see that but give me your th your take on that what do you think i mean that's that's the key right there is how much he's gonna have to suck down because if he's if he's got his weight under control and he's doing it kind of like how a, how a jose aldo did when he started cutting down and he's i'm pretty sure he started, even got down to 135 if i'm not mistaken and he's looking damn good in his last fights or it could have the worst effect on you you know take the peds out of the situation but have the effect of how a tj dillashaw did where he cut down to 25 and just completely looked sucked out couldn't handle a crack to the chin at all um i think it really does come down to prep so we're going to we're going to see the answer to your question, Derek, lies in the weigh ins. We're going to be able to see. And unfortunately, we're filming this before the weigh ins are like, I think they're going to happen very, very soon. Um, so we'll have to see it then, man. If he's looking sucked down and has a hard weight cut, then I think it's going to play into a factor. And that's it's in Barbosa. But if he you know, if he doesn't, if he's looking strong, it's going to be a benefit because we uh, it was proven in a couple of weeks ago, uh, Israel Adesanya versus uh, um, Blahovich. Yeah. yeah, where Izzy, you know, going up. 
the the bigger man was able to withstand the cracks and he was able and Izzy was getting hurt with the Blahovich shots. Same kind of issue here with Barbosa to Burgos. Will Barbosa be able to have that bigger weight? What is he actually walking in at, fighting at? You know, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be interesting. So that is a very big X factor that we're gonna have to see play out. I absolutely agree. And we can just say that Essen Barbosa looked absolutely fine in his last fight against Makwan Amir Khani, right? That was 145 pounds. He looked fine. He looks rejuvenated. He's on a new contract at the UFC, man. So it's going to be a good one. Lastly, I just want to point out how impressive it is that Shane Burgos, he lands seven significant strikes per minute at a 50% clip. That's just super impressive to me. That's ridiculous, man. That's that's. But that's because it's not loading up and really trying to take your head off with every single shot. So um, that's it, man. So let's give our picks, man. And AJ, real quick, just turn me down just a little bit in the phones. Uh, but we got to give our picks here. And Folks, I forgot to mention it, and I will mention it for the rest of them. Shane Burgos has actually opened up as a minus 120 favorite with a plus 100 comeback for Edson Barbosa. So the odds makers like the young Shane Burgos here, man. Uh, give me your pick, AJ. Who are you going with? Well, Derek, this one, like you said, it's a back and forth. It's going to be a lot of fun. But personally, I'm going Barbosa by decision. Just because, man, I think a lot of a lot of stuff can go into play in this factor. And I, I don't necessarily know if anyone's going to be KO'd. I think it's going to be a lot of kicks, going to be a lot of back and forth, even some wrestling maybe. We'll see. But I think it's going to be a long grind-out session, taking both fighters into deep water with the the experience Barbosa kind of edging them out with a decision win. Who's you, who do you got? Well, I think that this is going to be a back and forth war, like I said. But the one thing that I'm almost positive of is Edson Barbosa's power it translates around one, two, and three. The speed goes a little bit, but the power remains. And if that is the case, I think that the way that he dropped Makwan Amir Khani like twice or three times in the third round of their fight is going to be very similar to this one. I got a TKO or a KO round three, Edson Barbosa, man. I think Barbosa gets the job done. I think this is a what have you done for me lately uh, type of sport. And, you know, come on, man. He had a three fight losing streak, but it was to Dan Ige, Paul. Paul Felder and Justin Gaethje. It's literally like the best of the best. So listen, we spent a lot of time on that one. It's because I'm so surprised that it was, you know, even a, uh, uh, you know, just the opening fight on the pay-per-view, man. But let's move on to this next one, man. We got uh, blonde fighter, Caitlin Chukagian facing off against Viviani Ahaujo, man. This is going to be a banger. This is going to be a banger here, man. And what I have here is very similar to the Burgos Barbosa type matchup when I was doing my film study, right? So Caitlin Chukagian, BJJ Brown Belt. She's a former Cage Fury, 125 and 135 pound champion with the second most win and second most significant strikes at women's 125 pounds, man. But she's fighting a beast in a Haojo, right? Because a Haojo, BJJ black belt, Luda Livre, brown belt, former Pancrase, 115-pound champion. That just goes to show, with well, all those fancy words, she's really legit at her grappling and her wrestling and her ground game. That's basically what I'm trying to say here. Now, AJ, how does this fight stack up to you? You got a 34-year-old Haojo who is actually, I thought was younger, but she's like, she got to make it count right now, man. And Caitlin Chukagian has had many, many opportunities to be at that kind of top range in her division. But this is what it's really going to come down to, man, the experience factor. So what do you think? How do you think this fight plays out, man? Just X's and O's. Well, I mean, you you hit the both nails on the head, Derek. But I think uh, Caitlin Chukagian, she's going to play the same game that she did against Cynthia Calvillo, maintain that outside, keep distance. She has a very, very stiff jab, which a lot of people don't give her credit for. But she'll pink you. She'll, she'll hit you hard with that jab, keep you to the outside. And then she's very tall. She's 5'9", going to be fighting a 5'4 girl. And she's going to be able to maintain that clinch. Now, like you said, man, Vivian Arujo, she's a beast and extremely, extremely dangerous on the ground. Therefore, she can walk you down, man. She she can easily walk you down. Like, like we always talk about with the Brazilians that are so good on the ground that they're just down to throw hands. That's Vivian Arujo or uh, Ahujo. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> Vivian Ahujo. Um, you know, she's amazing at wrestling. She likes to, one thing, she likes to throw her right hand from the hip. It's kind of a crazy, crazy technique. But I was noticing, I think she's a natural lefty. Because mm -hmm. that left hand she has, she'll hit you hard. Throw those counter hooks hard, and then throw the right from the hip. She's she's there to to take head. You know, she or excuse me, she's there to take your head off. <laughs> but, but well, uh, Chayden Kagan is exactly that that power that uh that punches and bunches. She's going to strike you from the outside. So it's going to be interesting to see. Personally, I think Ohujo is going to be able to walk Chukagin down. Head hunting from the get go, throwing big looping shots. While while uh, Chukagian is going to try to throw down the pipe, maintain distance, and keep that vertical or that uh, that circular motion going all the way. What do you think? How do you see it? Well, I'm almost positive that this fight is taking place in Las Vegas, correct? And if it is, then we're fight. It's not Houston. This is in Houston. Okay, I thought it's that in was Houston, babe. Yeah, okay, right on, it's right got on. Uh, fans. 
Right on. Okay, I thought that was UFC 263 was going to be. Okay, but we in the big cage, so this changes things, right? Because if we're in Vegas, I'm going to say, okay, well, Chukagan's not going to have a lot of room to be moving around trying to get on her bike. But one thing we know is that in a big cage, Caitlin Chukagan likes to be on her bike. And it's very smart because when you're long, when you're rangy, and you can utilize your jab and constantly keep moving, you can't hit what you can't touch, right? Unfortunately, Chukagan is there to be hit at times, definitely, right? And Ahaljo, if she catches her with the right big hook, man, it's going to be game over. But I will say this, Ahaljo is a big, she's a, she's a, a very looping type of puncher, right? Everything is kind of big and wide and Chukagan is just down the pipe, blah, 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 right? That type of stuff, right? So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Nonetheless, I will say that both of them average about four, four and a half significant strikes landed per minute. But Ahaljo, even though she's on these big looping strikes, she lands at a higher clip, man, almost, uh, almost 50% where Chukagan is at 34%. But the reason why is because Chukagan throws a lot more than the rest of these fighters in her division, man. So I'm glad that you pointed out the height difference because I do think that's going to play a very, very large factor. I mean, look at Andrade when she tried to fight Valentina. It wasn't even a crazy height disparity, but still, Valentina was able to just kind of keep her at bay. Easy, easy work, man. Now, the big difference here is the takedowns, right? So, Ahaljo, she's at 2.3 takedowns per 15 minutes at a 64% clip. Uh, Chukagan has got a 51% takedown defense, man. So, she's just going to have to be able to stay away. That's going to be the game plan for this one. Nonetheless, AJ, neither of these fighters... Um, have like that real deal knockout power if you know what i mean like yeah they they can knock out their opponent definitely but they're not they don't make their bread and butter they don't make their name off of just starching opponents like that maybe like a zhang wei li or something a little bit different like that right nonetheless we're talking about experience caitlin chukagian is eight and four in the ufc while ahaljo is four and one in the ufc man uh i don't really have much else to say on this one other than if you look at the last five you will see that caitlin chukagian right cynthia calvillo jessica andrage antonina shevchenko and valentina shevchenko and Jennifer Maya, where Viviani or Ahaljo, she just beat up Roxanne Modafari, the happy warrior, so you gotta feel bad about that one. Montana De La Rosa, Jessica I, Alexis Davis, and then uh, Ber uh, Bernardo, I don't remember her first name. Nonetheless, Jessica I was the one loss on Ahaljo's record. Do you not see this fight playing out very similar? This is kind of like a Jessica I versus Ahaljo all over again, because it's a Shukagian, right? So, I mean, if we know anything, we know that that's a little something to keep in that, that psychology right there, where it's like, alright, she really needs this one, but ultimately, AJ, give me your pick man who, who are you going for in this one well first off Derek I gotta say man how you gonna okay. do my girl Roxy dirty like that bring her up <laughs> I was and and honestly though that was a Hujo's best one of her best fights I've seen man and she like you said didn't really have that knockout power but absolutely pieced up my girl Roxy it was it was it was hard to see but it was a really good fight and personally me Derek I'm going to Hujo by decision I think it's going to be crazy. I think this one this one has potential to be fight of the night, man. I, I'm not going with this one as my pick. I'll give that later. But this one's going to be a crazy fight because it's that Styles. Like you said, that Styles make fights. Jukagan's going to stay down the pipe. Well, Hujo's going to be hunting for the head with outside winging shots. It's going to be a lot of fun, even if it goes to the ground or in the clinch. Both these girls are very dangerous. But like I said, I got a Hujo by decision. Who you got? All right, I'm going blonde fighter, Caitlin Chikagin, man. There's just a lot of experience, man. You know, she's fought really high-level competition. I think that this is just going to be her saying, listen, man, this is one of those divisions that's, like, just shallow enough that you can't get rid of me. I'm going to come back. I'm going to fight Valentina again. And I don't... Listen, we could talk about this on the post show on Sunday, depending on who wins or loses, man. But I just don't know what to do with Caitlyn Chukagan if she wins again, honestly. You know what I mean? Because what do you do? Do you feed her to the Wolves uh, again like Valentina Shevchenko? Or is she Valentina Shevchenko just so dominant that at a certain point, she's going to have to, I don't know, man, go move up a weight class, do something. Once Amanda Nunes decides she's going to go to the PFL so she could go beat up on uh, Kayla Harrison or something like that. I don't know. I'm just joking. That will be a good fight nonetheless. But uh, all right, AJ. So that's what we got on that one, man. Uh, blonde fighter, unanimous decision for me if I didn't say unanimous. And lastly, okay, I'm going to do it for real this time. Minus 135 favorite is Chukagian with a comeback of plus 115 for Ahaljo. Now, move on to this next one, man. Danger Matt Schnell ranked at number eight in 125 pounds men's division versus number nine ranked Hogerio Bontarine. This is going to be a good fight, AJ, because both of these dudes could strike. Both of these dudes are good on the ground. Now, Bontarine is definitely have the, he definitely has the advantage on the ground, and Schnell definitely has the, uh, the advantage on the feet. Let's talk about a little bit of context, AJ. In their last fight, uh, Matt Schnell had to fight a real deal striker in Tyson Nam. He's a, he's a favorite here on, on this show, on this program, right? Um, and Hogerio Bontarine had to fight Kai Kara France. And while a lot of people, I mean, he had Kai Kara France in such trouble, man. It was ridiculous. He had a rear naked choke locked in, gassed his arms out. Kai Kara France got him out and just slept him, dropped him on his head, man. It was, it was bad. And Bontarine was so pissed off because Kai Kara France, he did a lap and he was going to come back and hit him again. And Bontarine got so mad, he took out his mouthpiece and just chucked it at him, you know, uh, uh, Steph Curry style, right? Uh, the question here, AJ, 
Do you think, I, I want to know in your opinion, man, both of these dudes, let's just say for the UFC, right? Matt Schnell is 5-3 and three in the UFC, and Bontarine is 2-2 two and two in the UFC. And now in terms of age, Matt Schnell is 31, and Bontarine is 29. Right now, who do you think has more to lose with a loss in this matchup right now? Bontarine's on a two-fight losing streak, so we already know that, but we can't really factor that in. I'm talking about a potential to really do things in this division, which is also kind of a shallow division at 125. Give me your take. Yeah, uh, I, I this one's hard because they're both kind of in that spot, like that that limbo spot of either I can go to the top or I'm going to be dropped off very far. Um, personally, I think Matt Schnell has a little bit more to lose. Um, he's kind of has a little bit more hype to him. He's had, you know, wins against Luis Smoka, like you said, the Tyson Nam split decision. He had a, a pretty, pretty devastating loss to Pantoja. So he's had a little bit more, I guess, media presence, at least in my mind. He has a little bit more kind of push to get up to the top whereas Bontarine not necessarily many people know about him I know I know definitely in his last five there's really only two notable names in Ray Borg and Kai Kara France both of them losses so he doesn't really have necessarily the bandwagon behind him to make this if he does lose this kind of like a, a super devastating loss besides the fact that he if he loses this he could possibly get cut so in that instance, maybe it's Bontarine, but personally, I think who has more to gain, who has more of that in, in my mind, if you have more to gain, you have more to lose. It's going to be Matt Schnell. Who do you think? I'd have to agree with you, but first off, you got to put a little respect to my guy, Paeva, man. He's fought Paeva too, dude. Don't forget about him, right? But no, I do agree. I think Machinel has a lot to lose. He has a minus 160 favorite in this fight with a one, uh, plus 135 comeback for Bontarine. Um, but I think he has a lot more to lose because at this point, he's been very uh, uh, critically acclaimed, I guess if you could say that, like fan love, right? People are like, dude, this dude's legit. He's been a sleeper on a lot of people's radar for a long time, and now it's finally starting to come to fruition. Nonetheless, man, um, let's just talk about this matchup, right? So we got a 70 inch reach for Matt Schnell who's going to be using that very very effectively against a 67 inch reach against Rogerio Bontarine. what we saw against Bontarine and Kai Kara France is that Bontarine has hands bro he could strike he could strike up there with the best of them maybe not the best of them but he could strike very very well the problem is what happens when this fight goes down to the ground right Kai Kara France is not nearly as decorated on the ground as a Matt Schnell is now Matt Schnell he is a karate black belt and a BJJ purple belt right so even though he's a purple belt this dude still got skills man his active guard is legit and one thing that I, I noted AJ that I always talk about this is what we need to do this is the Peter Quilly thing you get your back on the ground okay you got a nice open guard or yeah you have a nice open guard all that good stuff cool active and all that but he does a lot of ground to pound a lot of elbows right a lot of just strikes throwing hooks off of his back instead of sitting there and just accepting the position Matt Schnell is trying to inflict damage cause a cut on his opponent and that's what I think is going to be dangerous because Kai Kara France he just kind of got locked up in that rear naked choke and just had to defend 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 right now what's the difference when we see somebody who's actually not willing to just sit there and be submissive right um so if this fight does go to the ground we do know that Bontarini averages about two takedowns a fight at about a, a, a 40 percent clip in terms of accuracy and a 53 percent takedown defense for Matt Schnell where do you see this fight taking place at the most and who do you think is going to be leading the dance I think Schnell's going to be leading the dance to be honest Derek um I don't necessarily know so for me when I was breaking this one down kind of the X's O's back and forth I put Matt Schnell, he's good in the stand-up, but he's dangerous on the ground for specifically that. He's not going to accept his back on the ground. He's not going to accept the position. He's he's much more of that position over submission fighter, where even if he's has a shitty position, he's still going to be throwing, like you said, elbows, hooks off the bottom. He's going to be out there for blood. His his uh, nickname is Dangerous for a reason. He can really out, go out there and hurt you. Now, going back and forth, leading the dance, like I said, I think Schnell's going to do it. But if there's ever an advantage, it's definitely Bontarine in that random scramble in the first round when they're dry. It's the most dangerous time for us for a submission specialist, especially, you know, like you said, you're dry. Get that get that lock in pretty quick. But, you know, we saw Kai Kara France handle it. And it's kind of been the more the, – the tendency for the UFC, especially in the MMA community, the, the tendency more for, like I said, position over submission. So submissions are becoming less dangerous more the, the more and more people know about them. So therefore, to me, in my mind, that makes me think that Metchnell has a little bit more advantages on the ground because he stays dangerous instead of just looking to what some would consider peacefully end the night by putting you to sleep. I don't know. What do you think, Derek? Uh, I don't know, AJ. This is a tough one. This is, this is a tough one because I think, can you lead the dance walking backwards? You know what I mean? And the reason why I say that is because I think Matt Schnell is going to be on the back foot because Bontarine doesn't care. I'll take you to the ground, bro. I could walk forward all day long. He's these Brazilians that we like, right? Um, so, like, if we're talking about it that way, I think Matt Schnell could lead the dance off the back foot in his weird way, looking to just counter. You know what I mean? That's what he does. He does this a lot. He just stares at you and he goes... 
<laughs> that's that's Matt Schnell. That's what he does. You know what I'm saying? So um, listen, man, Matt Schnell, fourth least time spent in the bottom position, which is going to be important for this fight, man. He's only spent two minutes and 41 seconds in the bottom position at 125 pounds. Uh, but Bontarine, nine first round finishes. This will be his only his third fight in the USA, AJ. It's pretty, you know, that that means something. Just like the way Li Zhang, I brought that up. I was like, yeah, she didn't really fight in the USA, man. You're not going to get that love out here that you maybe have gotten in Abu Dhabi or, you know, out there and, you know, wherever you're fighting at. And then uh, the last thing that I got here, AJ, is that at the end of the day, Matt Schnell's only been submitted one time, and that was back in 2014, man. So I think it's going to be tough to submit the man, but it'll be a good matchup. It'll be a good matchup. And I'm going to give you my pick. I'm going to go Matt Schnell, and I got a unanimous decision win. I think it's going to be a very back-and-forth fun matchup, but I think that he's going to do enough to edge it out. What's your pick, AJ? Well, I got a couple things, Derek. First okay, off, please, man, please. Some, uh, I'm a big fan of audiobooks and Grand Cardone. He always says, who's the one that's really leading the conversation, the talker or the listener? It's usually the listener, my man. So there is a chance that you can lead the fight off of the back foot if you're letting them come in and you just counter strike like, like a sniper Conor McGregor or something. Um, and second, man, I'm so glad you noticed that thing about Matt Schnell. I wrote it down and I thought maybe I was like just overanalyzing this dude. But he literally, anytime he'll like movement, 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 <laughs> and then back and then he'll fight it's like the funniest i don't know man it was it was i'm so glad you pointed it out but for me derek i got schnell winning this fight ko round two i think he's gonna put it to him i don't i don't necessarily know if Bontarine can handle the the stand-up i think it's gonna be a crazy fight back and forth though right. but i do think that especially to me I, what what sealed the deal for me Bontarin had that like you said before with that kai car france where he did the lap and then came to knock him out again Bontrain stood up and threw the mouthpiece like bro if you were so agitated that you can stand up and throw a mouthpiece then you know how'd you get knocked out like you should you should have like uh, honestly at the end of the day he did get like tapped right on the nice spot so he sure. got put down couldn't really you know defend himself but you know he he, he, didn't, he let a little better than the gas tank so he he lost a fan in me so i'm going match now with a ko round two let me I'm, let me just, you know, give a little defense for my man. You know, he got dropped on his head, and when he tried to stand up, his legs buckled, so the ref stopped it. And I think he was more mad at the referee than anything else, being like, bro, this is an early stoppage. Like, I could still go. But at the end of the day, man, fighter safety, man. Because, listen, if you just if you literally just got flash KO'd like that, what happens when you get knocked out, AJ? You don't remember it, man. There was one time I've never been knocked out in terms of, like, a, any type of, like, uh, combat, anything like that, man. But one time I was skateboarding out there in Santa Barbara, and I literally face first into like a concrete wall. I was not, I couldn't remember any of that. I just woke up and what happened? Oh, okay, whatever. Like, so he probably didn't even remember it. He was like, bro, I'm good. What are you talking about? But nonetheless, man, it'll be a, it'll be a banger, man. And we look forward to seeing plenty of, you know, <laughs> that, that, that Matt Schnell head movement, man. But uh, let's move on to this next one, AJ. Okay, so for this one, we do got, I be asking folks, drop a comment, you know what I'm saying? Let us know what you want to know, and we'll answer all the questions you got if it's pertaining to the fight game, right? So we got a uh, homeboy that I interact with on Instagram, you know what I mean? Real love to, you know, at psych on Instagram. This dude is a legit musician out there getting it. Uh, he asked us a question, man, very simple, and we're going to tie this one into our breakdown, clearly. Tony or Benil, man, so shout out to you, psych, man. Shout out to all the people out there because we need more more questions man so don't just like don't just subscribe but drop a comment and ask us a question because we got you folks we answering them right here for you so um let's do a, a simple thing before we really break down man let's 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 entertain and answer my man's question Tony or Benil. Now, outside of the analyst, we're not talking about the analyst, AJ, right now. We're not talking about the analyst, Derek, right now. This is not all factors considered. We're talking about just as a person, we sitting down with the boys, Tony or Benil. AJ, what do you think? Ooh, that's that's almost a harder question. Yeah. That is almost a harder question. Who do I like more all around than in this particular fight? Like this particular fight breaking down was a lot easier for me. I'm a big fan of El Kukui, my man. I'm a oh. big fan of old school Tony Ferguson, the weirdo, like the 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 wearing the the gloves with the baseball and the and the glasses on the inside. And whenever he'd shout at the woo at the weigh-ins, he'd go Ric Flair mode. I'm a big fan of El Kukui. And not only that, he has that mindset of like you're going to die before I am. I'm going to take your soul. He's on that David Goggins shit, which I absolutely love. Now in Benil Daryush, man, I love him so much because we saw he has that same savage mindset of like, you hit me? Okay, now it's my turn. Like, I'm going to hit you twice as hard, but you better knock me out because I'm coming for your lunch money, which I absolutely, like, that gets me excited, man. That's why I love this fight so much coming forward because these these are the dudes who we are, you know, everybody goes to high school and you're like, all right, yeah, don't fuck around with that guy. Yeah, you probably don't fuck around with that guy either. Like, these two dudes are going to fight? Fuck yeah, bro. I'm so excited. Personally, if I had to answer it, 
I'm gonna go old school. I'm gonna go with Tony Ferg, Derek. That's my yeah. boy El Kukui. I love Benny Daryush. He's especially in the new the new come up. But I can't, you know, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't disrespect homeschool. You know what I'm saying? So I'm going Tony Ferg. Who you got? Well, listen, man, this is kind of that same situation as I sit here and I say like the fan in me, the dude who like watches all of these fights every single week and who's up to date on this, man. How can you how can you not love a Benny Dariush, man, a dude who has been getting after it for so long, who's finally getting an opportunity that he has deserved for so, so long. He's just knocking these dudes out, man. Six fight win streak, killing the game. But then I say, listen, man, who have I known about damn near my whole entire life watching this? Tony Ferguson, El Kukui, man, this is a man who we really argued to say. Can he beat Khabib? Can he be the one to beat Khabib? You can't have that level of stature. We can't talk about a fighter like that and sit there and be like, okay, well, yeah, maybe he could beat Khabib, but I don't think he could beat Daryush. Like, where do how do we how does that MMA logic, you know what I'm saying, line up? So at the end of the day, this is a dude who is a former interim lightweight champion. This is a dude who has the mindset of, yeah, you just hyperextended my arm. Anybody else in the UFC would have tapped to that when Charles Oliveira had him, had his arm under the shoulder and just cranked back on it. Oh Lord, man, my arm hurts just thinking about it right and what does he do he says oh yeah that's light what's up bro it's all good i'm gonna get back up hop back up go back to my corner and we coming out round two and three and guess what charlie olives you can't finish me i got one arm and you can't finish me so for that reason there's a mental fortitude that comes with tony ferguson that's a little bit different than benny daryush and the reason why i say this, this is unanalytical right this is just my personal right just my fan my home fan perspective Tony Daryush has, I mean, uh, Tony Daryush, Tony Ferguson, El Kukui has that legitimate, I will die in this cage, man. I think that once again, think about this again, right? When it was the, uh, it's like all these opportunities where it's like that gold belt is just dangled in front of him, right? Once again, you're fighting on the co-main for the lightweight championship. This is a dude who's supposed to be fighting for the championship. So I think that this dude is looking at it like, listen, man, everything happens for a reason. I'm just going to keep walking forward. I'm going to, I could do the speed bag with my elbows. I'm just a beast. Like, come on. Oh, El Kukui, so I got to go with you, man. We old school out here. We like, just like the David's, the David Goggins mentality, we love that El Kukui mentality, man. But time to put back our analytics hat back on, AJ. Number five ranked Tony Ferguson, who dropped two straight to Justin Gaethje and Charles Oliveira, is facing off against a Muay Thai black belt under Rafael Cordero in Benil Dariush, man. He's a BJJ black belt, a BJJ world no-gi champion in 2010, but Tony Ferguson is no slash, no slouch, man. This dude is throwing Iminari rolls, all types of craziness because he is a 10th planet, uh, 10th planet BJJ black belt under Eddie Bravo, man, the world-renowned Eddie Bravo. So let's talk about it, AJ. Uh, Tony Ferguson needs a win bad here man he's talked about it himself he's saying listen man I've, i let some things uh kind of go in bad directions you know what i mean i left some of my camp some of my team that i've had with me for my whole entire career but now he's trying to like fortify those relationships again so he can get back on his in, into his winning ways man let's not forget he was on a 12 fight win streak prior to losing these last two man so this dude is an absolute savage um who has an advantage on the ground as opposed to the feet aj uh, i think tony ferguson's gonna have to have the advantage on the ground man we we did see him get bullied in that, I know it's gonna sound crazy, right? <laughs> it's like it's gonna sound crazy because we saw him get bullied absolutely in that Charles Lee verified. When's the last time you've heard Tony Ferguson got bullied, right? Yeah. But that being said, man, I think that had to that had to have something against him. You know, that had to have kind of like a like who am I? Like you said, a, a, a reexamination of everything you've been doing, and you got to get back to Tony Tony Ferguson, man, rolling around like you said, a Minari roll Ferguson, man. Uh, but that being said, I think I think. It's going to sound crazy with me, so bear with me, Derek. But I think Daryush has the advantage on the hands, man. I think he can outstrike. He has a little bit more, not necessarily grit or determination, but kind of that that factor of I'm down to play tag. Or don't get me wrong, even Tony Ferguson has that exact same thing. So it's almost hard to say one way or the other. Like it, In my mind, Tony Ferguson almost has all the win, all the advantages, right? Except I think he has the advantage for sure on the ground. But in that stand-up, there's this one thing – where even though Tony Ferguson wasn't or was finished by Justin Gaethje, he wasn't actually finished. Yeah. Like, like it, it was a, it was a referee stoppage. I was like, all right, bro. Like you, <laughs> you've taken way too much damage. We, the, the massive human audience that's watching this cannot watch a man get punched in the face anymore. Yeah. We got to stop this fight. Tony Ferguson was not finished. So it's going to be a hard fight regardless so that being said, I think it's going to be walking down a game of tag back and forth, which you see in the Drakkar close fight. You play a game of tag with Benny Daryush, it's going to be a very short game. Now, that's I don't, I don't know. It's a, it's a hard answer, man. Who do you think? Well, listen, man, I think that on the ground, 
I got to say that this is going to be up for grabs. I think it's going to be very similar to the Diego Fajeda versus Benny Daryush fight, man, where they're just both sick with it going back and forth in these scrambles. You know what I mean? I think it's going to be like that. One difference is, is that we know when it goes into one of those dirty, chaotic fights, who is the best of the best at dirty, chaotic fights? Tony Ferguson is. He is the master of that. So if this is a clean fight, I think it's a disadvantage for both of these fighters, oddly enough, right? Because neither of these dudes want to be in just a clean, technical matchup. But let's take a take a step back. I believe this was Tony Ferguson versus Edson Barbosa, man some years back, right? Tony Ferguson just put an absolute pace on Barbosa. So I think he's going to need to return there on the feet if he wants to have the advantage in the striking because what he can do, even though he's not the most technical striker, even though he doesn't have the most power behind his shots, one thing that Tony Ferguson can do is he can absolutely drown his opponent. Why? Because he keeps you on your back foot. Jab, jab, hook, Imanari roll, grab your ankle, get back up, elbow, hooks, hooks, you know what I mean? Like that's Tony Ferguson and we know El Kakui is known for having cardio. He's known for being, not getting tired, man. This dude's a foreign, he's got the wrestling background round he's got the third most significant strikes landed at 155 pounds 1070 significant strikes landed throughout his mma career at that weight class in the ufc uh six time fight of the night winner and a three time performance of the night winner we know my man tony ferguson is going to bring it we know this that's not a question now the question comes down to Benil Daryush has the fifth most control time at 155 pounds with an hour and seven minutes of control time man he's a four-time performance of the night winner and a one-time fight of the night winner um he's a southpaw they both throw a lot, but Benny Daryush has the, t the tendency to fall into these firefights, AJ. And we're just going to, you know, I'll give my last little take before we wrap this up. If Benny Daryush falls into a firefight again, that'll probably be like the fourth time in the last five fights. How many times can you do that successfully in this crazy game of combat sports before you don't end up successful in there, man? I honestly believe that you have like a certain luck in this MMA world and the MMA gods at a certain point are going to say, all right, bro, just like Conor McGregor getting slept, man. It's like, it's only a matter of time until you're the one that gets starts. You can't just start everybody forever unless you're Floyd Mayweather, right? That's like the only exception. Nonetheless. Uh, Benny Daryush is the only one out of these two that actually actively shoots for takedowns. So he averages about two takedowns a fight at a 32% at a clip, which is actually very, very bad. Um, and Tony Ferguson has a 70% takedown defense. Now, uh, before we talk about ultimately the pick, right, I'm just going to run through the last five. For Tony Ferguson, Charles Oliveira, Justin Gaethje, uh, both losses, right? UD lost to Oliveira in a TKO round five loss to Gaethje. Second round TKO against Cowboy Cerrone, which has aged very poorly now that we've seen how Cowboy Cerrone's career has more or less played out. Big win over Anthony Pettis, Showtime Pettis, knockout round two, who is no longer in the UFC and lost his PFL debut. Doesn't look very good either. And then uh, submission round three against Kevin Lee, man. That's the only one that's pretty impressive. Now, nonetheless, uh, for Darius, Diego Fajeda. SD win, split decision. I think that was more unanimous than anything. Nonetheless, knockout over Scott Holtzman, knockout over Jakar Close, submission over Frank the Crank Camacho, and then a big, big submission against Drew Dober, man. So both of these dudes are surging, except Charles Oliveira, or not Charles, Charles Oliveira, Tony Ferguson to just come off of a couple tough losses, man. You know, it happens against the best of the best. I'm going to go contrary to everything that I just said, AJ. You know what we're about to do. I'm going to go Benny Dariush, man. I think he gets the job done because momentum, man, when momentum is going good, it's going good. And tell me that this isn't the worst possible situation for Tony Ferguson, man. You finally get your get right spot and it's against a dude who, yeah, he's ranked number nine, but he has the skill level of like number three, number four. So Benny Dariush, man, I think this is the Angela Hill situation. It's just the culmination of all of this time. Culmination of all of this experience, all these wins, all of these lesser opponents, which is going to get him, which is going to allow him to propel against Tony Ferguson, and I got a unanimous decision win, which is a potential fight of the night. Not my fight of the night, but potential fight of the night. What's your pick, AJ? They say luck is when preparation meets opportunity, right, Derek? And I yeah. think that's what Tony has given to Benny Daryush, being like, hey, man, I know a lot of people aren't willing to fight you. I'm down. Let's scrap. And I think I think uh, Benny, Benny Daryush is going to look back at Tony Ferguson and thank him for this opportunity, because it's going to be a hell of a fight. We, the fans, are going to be very excited for this fight, man. It's going to be a scrap. Daryush brings the war and Tony literally never ever says quit so it's gonna be a war man it's gonna be a lot of fun but personally man I'm going Daryush by decision I think it's gonna be a grinder I think he's gonna actually utilize a lot more takedown like you said he's gonna be shooting for the takedowns a lot where uh Ferguson he's gonna be hitting the rolls he's gonna be hitting the sprawls off his back you know he's got a lot of movement so it's gonna be a very fun action-packed fight very fast a lot of pace but I just think Daryush man he's gonna be riding that momentum carrying that win the wins he's been he's been uh you know getting this whole last what is it like uh six fight win streak and being able to just out grind tony ferguson i know it sounds crazy coming out of my own mouth right now somebody's gonna out grind tony ferguson but in the eyes of the judges the dude taking the people down having the control on top 
usually gets the dub. And I think that's how it's going to go for Dariush. Yeah, man, it's going to be a good one. And I just will say this, Tony Ferguson, he didn't get absolutely steamrolled against Charles Oliveira. He actually did have a little bit of success on the ground against Charles Oliveira, but the setups didn't come to fruition. Uh, he even did a little post, uh, Tony Ferguson did a little post-fight breakdown of his own being like, damn, see, I had this opportunity right here, but I should have did this and it almost happened. And at the end of the day, dude was fighting with one arm. So, all right, AJ, main event time. This is the lightweight championship, man. This is finally allowing us to fill the vacant lightweight hole that's been in there since Khabib said, listen, man, I'm done. Dana White tried to convince him to come back. Dude's like, I'm done, bro. Relax. Now, is this the championship fight at 155 pounds that the people want and deserve? Absolutely not. But it's the one that we're going to get. And at least for the time being, we're going to have a new king at the 155 pound uh, division, right? So Charles Oliveira opens up as a minus 134 favorite against Michael Chandler. And I'm not going to lie to you, AJ. I was a little surprised. I thought Chandler would be a favorite simply because of all the hype, simply because of the what have you done for me lately? Ooh, you knocked out Dan Hooker. Now this dude's ready to be champion. It's like, okay, I still didn't see three rounds of Michael Chandler in the UFC I saw one punch basically it was one punch and then some follow-up ground and pound and that was literally the fight right so it wasn't even a fight it was just a starching at the end of the day we got an NCAA division one silver medalist in 2008 and 2009 at the University of Missouri in Charles uh, Michael Chandler and Charles Oliveira man third degree BJJ black belt under Erickson Cardoso second most submission wins at 155 pounds with eight Third most finishes at 155 pounds with 10. 10-time uh, 10 performance of the night winner, three-time fight of the night winner. Very, very decorated, man. Michael Chandler, man. What what are the odds um, that we see a, a Chandler versus Dan Hooker, number two, man? Do you think this happens? I think it's it's definitely uh, on paper set up for that, right? Yeah. And like you said, we didn't see any any round two. We didn't see anything past two minutes of, tra- of uh, Michael Chandler. So it's going to be weird to say what we're actually going to see. But man, I think that's that's kind of where it's going, right? The the long rangey striker, the dude is gonna hurt you from the outside, even get you up with some some knees while you're shooting in against the wrestler who's gonna outgrind you, put you know, put, take it down to that, take it down to the ground, put a hole in your face. It's gonna be it's gonna be weird, man. I have this one. This one is a crazy fight to me. I'm I'm very happy we're finally having a champ in the 155 pound division. But it's weird when a, a title is going basically to the number one contender because we all know, uh, damn, I just blanked. Uh, Dustin Poirier. Poirier. Yeah. We all know Dustin Poirier is the people's champ. So yeah, what, what do you think, Derek? Well, listen, man, I think that Michael Chandler, like he can win this fight, and that's the craziest part. And my thing, the reason why I give him an edge, a slight edge, is because of his wrestling, right? When you're a high level wrestler, and Michael Chandler is one of the highest level wrestlers in MMA. Now, does he use his wrestling a bunch in MMA? No, not necessarily. He's really just a big striker, right? But being having the ability to be a wrestler, you can be inside control and in half guard successfully without putting yourself in danger of a submission if you're that high level of a wrestler, right? Now, the problem comes, can you stay in control, inside control, and in half guard without falling into the full guard of Charles Oliveira? Because once you fall into the web of Oliveira, man, it's going to be a long night, right? Here's the thing about Charles Oliveira as well that's really interesting, that makes it kind of interesting for this matchup, right? Oliveira can get dropped and immediately jump guard, right? Like, that's the difference between him and somebody who's not as well-versed on the ground like that is you get hit and you're not a grappler like that and you just drop, you're just trying to shell up and trying to get out the way. Oliveira, I've seen him get tagged on his chin, absolutely dropped and immediately close the guard and then start scrambling. Next thing you know, dude's in like an arm triangle, you know what I mean? Like, just like randomly. It's like, okay, right on, dude. So... This is a dude who's also a finisher, man. AJ, isn't it a little bit surprising to sit here and look at Charles Oliveira and people say, oh, who is this dude fought? He hasn't fought nobody. Let's just look at the last five, not even the names, but the results, right? Unanimous decision win against Tony Ferguson. We talked about that. Submitted Kevin Lee round three. Knocked out Jaron Gordon. Jaron Gordon's legit, bro. If you people sleeping on him, he is legit. Knocked him out round one. Nick Lentz, the rematch, right? They fought, I think it was a no contest the first time. Now the second time, knocked him out round two. Nick Lentz is one of the most legit wrestlers in MMA. Um, well, not anymore because he retired, but he once was, right? And then David Tamer, submission round two, man. Like, come on, man. He's finishing. Finish, 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 finish. And Michael Chandler, I mean, it's kind of the same, right? TKO round one, KO round one, KO round one. Gets knocked out by, you know what I mean, Pitbull, right? Uh, Patricio. And then a uh, unanimous decision. Both of these fighters only have one decision, one in their last five. But nonetheless, who do you give an edge to, AJ? I already have my answer if this fight goes five rounds. Because in their last five, both of these dudes are going to be in new territory going five full rounds. So who do you give the edge to? 
that's a hard one, right? In five full rounds, that's the that's the one we still haven't seen. Because Charlie Oliveira, he's grown up, grown up in the UFC. You know, we we know this dude. Or if you've been if you've been watching for a while, he's had his ups and downs, man. He's had you know fought amazing people, had lost to amazing people, beat some really notable people. But lately, he's been on a crazy eight fight win streak. If I had to give the edge overall, like on pa- paper to paper, I would say Charlie Oliveira, man. He's been in it for longer. He's been doing it thirty and eight with a one no contest is absolutely insane but at the same time michael chandler 22 and 5 the difference is who's been doing it at the ufc who's been doing it at the top of the top of the heap for a long long time but what about the five rounds though like if it goes five rounds charles Oliveira's never fought five rounds in his career that was my next that was exactly it but now the whole factor of the five round comes into play because charlie olives has literally never fought there so he has we, we sure we don't have any info on chandler in the ufc past two minutes but we do have a lot of him in other organizations, deep, deep waters. We don't have that with, with Charlie Olive. So it's going to be interesting to see. So personally, me, I give the edge to Char- or, uh, Michael Chandler all around. I don't really see how, I guess on paper anyway, where he's out labeled or outmatched in any sort of way besides submissions and that ground game. But really, Derek, to me, what, what do you think the chances are that when Michael Chandler takes down Charlie Olive, that he's going to get submitted? I, I don't really see that being much of an option. I think, don't get me wrong, it can happen. But I'm saying like 20%. I don't know. What do you say? I think there's a very high likelihood. And the reason why is because Charles Oliveira is sneaky, man. It's not like, when you watch him put that arm bar on Tony Ferguson, it came from nowhere. And Tony Ferguson is one of the most well-versed grapplers in the UFC, am I right? So if you can do that against a real deal grappler, what can you do against a Michael Chandler? Now, let me put some respect on Michael Chandler's name, man, because a lot of us talk about him like he hasn't done anything. This is a three-time Bellator lightweight champion. This is a man who has the most submissions in Bellator lightweight history with six. But just like all bets aren't created equal... All submissions aren't created equal either, man. Oliveira could do it against everybody, anybody. It does not matter. But there is one major factor here, AJ, um, that we have to take into account. Michael Chandler said it the best, right? He was all like, listen, man, there's two things that you can't teach about an athlete, about a fighter, about a person in general in life. You can't tweet. You can't teach quit and you can't teach not quit, right? He says, Michael Chandler, he's like, I'm the definition of not quit. Chandler Ol- or Charles Oliveira, he's quit before. And Michael Chandler just keeps doubling down. He's like, bro, I'm going to make him quit. I'm just going to drown him, and I'm going to make him quit. Because that that is a real thing, man. And I have seen different fights. I think it was the uh, Ricardo Lamas fight against Charles Oliveira, man. You know what I mean? He just got put in that position of, of that submission. And, I mean, there's the people who say, all right, that's it. Good fight. Maybe fighting for the lightweight championship was enough for me. And then there's the people saying, fuck this. I'm going – I'm not tapping. This is it. This is my life. This is everything to me. And the, at least because Michael Chandler is much more well-spoken, you know, he's an American, you know, he at least talks a good game about how he's really well-versed for this and Charles Oliveira isn't. Nonetheless, man, um, I think it's going to be a good one. But you see we're over the time, man, so let's give our pick and then go on to the fight of the night so we can get this thing out the way, man. Um, for the lightweight championship of the world, for arguably the most stacked division in MMA all around globally, right, who do you think is going to be and new come uh, Saturday evening, man? Man, I think it's going to be Michael Chandler. I think the only way to beat him is to walk him down and out-bully the bully just like Patricio Pitbull did. And I don't think Charlie Olives is going to do that, man. I'm seeing another Dan Hooker KO round one from Michael Chandler. I, I don't know who called him it, but I think it's an amazing nickname, the Power Wombat. I think he's going to absolutely destroy Charlie Olives. Who you got Why, Derek? All right, man. Well, this is unless Michael Chandler pulls that one hitter quitter that he did against Patricky Pitbull, that right hand over the top that just flatlined him. I think Charles Oliveira gets the job done. I think it's a unanimous decision to win. I think there's going to be a lot of submission attempts. But the one factor that I didn't talk about that I will bring up now is that Michael Chandler is a little heavy on that lead leg and Mike and Charles Oliveira could beat up that that leg all day long, man. He has had more weapons, elbows, kicks, strikes from distance, grapples, sprawls, Imanari rolls, jumping guard. He has way too many weapons, in my opinion. I think it'll make him a little more well-rounded. And guess what, man? This dude has been in this UFC limelight for years and years and years and years. And Michael Chandler has only been under the bright lights once. Bellator lights are bright, but not as bright as the UFC, man. So I'm going Charlie Olives, Charles Oliveira, Doe Bronx. Put some respect on my man's name. Unanimous decision to win. Contrary to, I do think he can get a submission. I think there's a very high likelihood. But I'm going to hedge my bet, and I'm going to go UD on that one. AJ, now you know what time it is. And now, the all factors considered fight of the night picks are in. But before you give me your pick, AJ, I just need to, you know, get a little bit of, a little bit of, you know what I mean? Suspense. Let's go. Give me your pick after this one.
Man, Derek, I'm going to go with the layup. Tony Ferguson, Benil Daryush. I think it's an easy call, but if you want something a little crazier, man, tune in to the prelims. Mike Grundy versus Lando Venata. Lando Venata always brings the heat. Who you got? All right, well, I mean, you stole one of mine, but I'll still make it dramatic. <laughs> So I actually, I was going to go Ferguson versus Dariush, and then I changed it to that Mike Grundy, Lando Venata. But if we're not going to do that, if I got to be original and pick my own, then I'm going to go with my sleeper. Jamie Pickett versus Jordan Wright, man. It's going to be a banger. These dudes have a lot, a lot of power, and I think it's going to end early. So maybe we don't get fight of the night. Maybe it's a performance of the night instead, but it should be a banger nonetheless, folks. But uh, listen, man, we covered just about everything, folks. So definitely drop a like once again, subscribe to all the good stuff that you need to do to keep helping us climb up them analytic ranks, man. All the SEOs, you type in all factors considered, and that's what pops up. Us, not anything else, and all that good stuff, man. So we appreciate you. Please ask us some questions. We'll answer them on the post show or on the preview show for next week. But nonetheless, man, you see the subscribe button. That's all you need to do. That's it for us, folks. Until next time, peace.